the drill, the gentleman standing in the left panel, imagined that a city should be designed for people. And these are some of the images he has in mind. But as it turns out, the reality is we started to design our cities only for our cars. And people kind of went to the wayside. They have to rush themselves across the street. We find out we failed to build appropriate infrastructure. We spend now more time in the cars than we'd like, and we don't have the kinds of streets that we're proud of. So the idea behind complete streets and the efforts that will be made on Buchanan and, and San Pablo is that all future funds that we invest in a road should be increasing land value and livability and never decrease. That we've gotten to a point we cannot afford to continue to downgrade the quality of life in people's communities. So every scene that you see unfold with what we call photomorphs is showing us how other cities have envisioned a brighter and a better future. And many have now built to it and found out that these things actually work. They pencil out. Land goes up in value, people have better experiences, uh, we attract more jobs and so on. So our opportunity in this uh, uh, environment is really to work on the entire length of San Pablo and also Buchanan. Uh, these are the op opportunities of the moment. They both need some support and help. And in doing so, there will be many different variations as we go through the corridor. So my job is to walk us through the process. We held quite a number of focus group meetings. These are interviews with specific groups that have ideas and interests in common, whether they're representing schools, as is in uh, this case, or people or advocates for uh, uh, people of all abilities to be able to travel and, and move through their community or bicycling and walking, people who become advocates for the things that have been overlooked. We also had a, a, a number of great meetings with, with staff, with different public agencies, and really gained a lot of knowledge. And likewise, from the business, the economic development communities, people that are here to provide the services and the support. And likewise, people that have very important, often unique needs to stay in motion, for example, for our emergency responders. All of our designs have to meet the needs of every group you see here and others. We started Thursday evening with an open uh, public meeting. And with that, uh, we asked people to craft vision cards. These are all now recorded and part of the plan. And uh, although uh, we need to move a, a bit fast and you can't read each of these, there are many, uh, close to 50 or 60s. But I think the thing that was so important is as we saw these cards uh, play out, uh, everybody had a very common, a very similar vision, which is something we always share, that we have never worked in a community where people have different visions, different values. They celebrate the same things. That's why they typically live where they do and why they're willing to work together. So the second activity we did, which was to declare what people value we found out uh, a top list of those things valued the most in Albany. And again, if I did this in a different community, just 10 miles away, the values are going to be different. Uh, they tend to be unique everywhere. And, uh, and it helps us as designers to know how to go about putting things together. We then did brainstorming. And with brainstorming, did what we refer to as dot voting, so that people could vote up their highest priorities. Uh, I'll put this in a list for you so it makes a lot of sense, but I think you can see at a glance uh, certain ones received a huge number of votes. And that doesn't mean that one that received fewer votes, like public art, isn't important. It just means that some things are so important that as designers we needed to, to focus on that. Number one was trees. Uh, you seem to understand and respect that trees add immense value to your community, and they also do a lot of work, slowing traffic appropriately, creating shade, creating ambiance, creating place, and so on. Uh, followed very quickly by the importance of regional bicycle trails, traffic calming, cafes, outdoor seating, mid-block crossings. Uh, obviously, you can read for yourself, but I think it's important to point out 
that when you got to the work tables, you were able to work down the list of priorities so that the things that you put on paper uh, really did reflect those things you most care to see. Now, this will all be in the written report, but I want you to get an overview of some of the things that were, were most important. Saturday, we started our events with uh, a really healthy looking group to me, you know, gathered around the tree here, ready to start a walk. And uh, we broke into two different groups so that we had a nice size or scale. Michael led one of the groups, I led the other. We traveled uh, significant parts of both Buchanan and um, San Pablo and discovered things that were working, but a number of things that weren't. Tested out the speeds of traffic and uh, then came back and uh, at, with a debriefing after the walk, started to have folks work around work tables uh, to lay out their thoughts, their ideas, in some cases just indicate there's a problem here, what the problem was, or in other cases, making recommendations for solutions. You had gone through some training, you had some ideas of what vocabulary to use, and then uh, each group came and presented, so, and all of this was dutifully recorded and will become part of the report. Now, uh, there's so many comments that we won't be able to go through each table, but uh, you can see here some of the highlights. And as we go from one table to the next, uh, and as we go down the corridor at each table, I think you're going to see uh, a lot of overlap from table to table. So uh, these are all just part of table one. Uh, for anywhere from a comment maker there, here, <laughs> to bulb outs or curb extensions are also called uh, queries about uh, appropriate designs. Again, table two, you're going to see a lot of overlap here. Uh, with table two, and, uh, and this all was able to then be assembled into a composite whole, which then guided our design team to go forward and start to put together uh, a set of solutions that best reflect uh, what you were saying in common. Uh, and again, a lot of knowledge, a lot of insight from the community on what is needed. Again, table three. Uh, a lot of places for crossings and gateways and bike uh, ped bridge connection over the water, all kinds of cool stuff that although they came out in the focus groups, it was really good to see that they finally got mapped in a meaningful way. And uh, then we started doing a little bit of sketch overlays. That is, I think this was done by one of the uh, tables. Am I right? People uh, were able to sit and figure out what they'd like an area to look like. Now, with that, we went back after giving our team a day of rest and then pulled them back together bright and early Monday morning. And when I got there and I saw them, I said, you think these guys are getting ready for a huge bank heist? <laughs> well, don't they look like it? I mean, they, they, this could be the Ocean's Eleven team, I'll tell you, it could be. Uh, but you could tell they were serious about what they were preparing to do. Let me go back one. Michael, would you introduce the Nelson Nygaard team, in fact, the entire design team, because you know all the names. And you know where the laser is. I do. <laughs> all right, so we have John Gibbs, who's here tonight. John, he's with WRT. Wallace Robertson Todd, they're uh, our sub consultant. I'm Michael Moll. I'm with Nelson Nygaard. You can see me there and there. Um, Magnus Barber with Nelson Nygaard. He's one of our designers um, and planners. You know this guy. Josh Meyer is in the room right here with the Local Government Commission, and uh, they're, they're the, um, the uh, sub, sub recipient of the grant funds with the city. I helped them apply for the grant and, and, and working with the city on this whole project. Um, Jan Tay here, who is with WRT. I think Jan, Jan Tay is here as well. There he is. And uh, Mike Alba, also one of our designers, Nelson, Nelson Nygaard. And missing from here is Danielle, who is in the room. At least she was a moment ago. There she is, waving in the back. Uh, also with Nelson Nygaard. Um, not not pictured here, though. I think that covers it for our team. Good. Thank you, Michael. So with that, let's uh, move right on into the, the production steps. A lot of uh, uh, very high-level things were going on, including math. They were actually doing math here. That proves that they're engineers. And uh, then a lot of graphics, which you're going to see unfold for you tonight. These are unique to your community. 
They celebrate your challenges and opportunities. Oh, and by the way, let's all wish Michael a happy birthday. Today's his birthday. How good is that? And uh, now, just real quickly, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Michael. Uh, the most important thing is that all of the designs need to reflect your people, your opportunities. And so I'm just going to do a very quick cavalcade of some of the, the images that we shot during the last five or six days that we were able to be together and see how people are using the streets, uh, getting across streets, exploring uh, the different edges, noting the speeds, the turning speeds, uh, events going on at the schools, and all of these things help shape and form our, our way of trying to reflect what you care about and now how to design. So with that, let's turn it over to Michael Mull. And Michael, are, are you ready? All right. Thank you, Dan, for the introduction. And I'm going to, John Gibbs and I are going to present together. We're just uh, getting the second microphone set up so we can kind of tag team here. Um, we're going to go back and forth between more street design and engineering and planning oriented items. And um, John with WRT is going to talk more about um, landscape and gateway features and that sort of thing. We're, we're, we'll, you'll see us go back and forth a little bit in this, in this presentation here. So. I'll do the clicking, we'll both do the talking, and we'll, we'll go through what we've, we've pr uh, produced over the last three days. <clears throat> so we're just going to start with this. John, I think you want to cover this one, right? <clears throat> yeah, I think we, we've heard a lot about the character and the values of this community. And I think where we wanted to start was Monday morning when we started putting pen to paper. It was translating all that you have said. And I think that you know, my brain is entirely full of all the ideas that you guys have impressed upon us. And I think while we're talking a lot about very technical mobility and transportation components, all of these things add up to a sense of character and a sense of place. This is your community. And so this is a, a, a diagram that we put together that talks about where are the entrances to your communities? Where are these gateways? What we were hearing were that the creeks are extremely important uh, to this community. The Salmon Bearing Creek of Cordonesis, El Cerrito Creek at the north end, that these actually form the gateways and the boundaries to your community. We're very inspired by that. We've looked at Buchanan as both a gateway into your town, but also as the gateway to the bay, and then perhaps out to the Albany Bulb, the wonderful historic and recreational valued shoreline. So Buchanan has a real important character to it, and you'll start to see the ideas for gateways for planting treatments that are begin to be expressed here. And secondary areas of focus, be it the intersection uh, with, with Marin and Buchanan or the Solano Avenue intersection and the kinds of character, the small scale treatments that start to create defined places or what we might call nodes at some of those locations. Yeah, and as part of that, we, we drove a lot of the community. We walked up and down all of Buchanan and San Pablo, but also drove much of the community to really see how these gateways and how these nodes fit into the community's character. I think at the next scale, it's really thinking about on the ground details. This is beyond the scope of, of what we can put together in three days, but there's a rich history of Albany, whether it's dynamite, uh, whether it's the, 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 the refuse dumping that occurred at the, at the early Guild Tract as sort of the foundation of this town and in departing from, from Berkeley. There's, there's richness there. There's seashells in paving associated with the Ohlone Indians. Those are the things that we want to see evolve over time. And so we all started looking at the sort of the networks. We you know, looked at the active transportation plan um, and bike networks shown in there and, and sort of, okay, what are some of the, the networks that, that we see being the primary bike, bike network and, and thinking about, about San Pablo. And, and we'll, as you'll see as we get to in a moment, we've got a couple options for that as far as having bike lanes or using what we're going to call super sharrows, shared lane markings, um, to, with the two main alternatives for San Pablo. Um, the the you know, other roads that provide alternatives, of course, here, um, Adams and Canes, along, along, also shown in the, in the active transportation plan. But focusing in this area a little bit, don't actually show all the connections that are proposed potentially for additional trail connections through here, also, that UC Berkeley has proposed to, to provide um, connections from this area up towards the Buchanan bikeway as well, um, potentially a, a shared use path system that goes all the way up into this area, also shown. And here on one of the table maps, um, someone wrote, Gorbachev, tear down this gate. Um, you all know, so many of you know where that is. There's a gate, a gate there that keeps the uh, access to the park from the, 
for, for, for the UC Village residents um, being direct. And um, that's, that's one of the many, there's another gate and fence here that we noticed that, again, opening that up, and, and, and we don't show it on this map, but we should have gotten it. This was one of the last things we did just before we came over here. Another line in this area to show that another possible future connection here for walking and biking only, at least, to get uh, into, into Berkeley and, and to other areas of the, uh, the region. Um, so let's focus now on San Pablo Avenue a bit, <clears throat> um, and then we'll move on to Buchanan after that. So first, the existing cross-section. We um, drew this up to kind of show you what was there today so we could then talk about what is proposed. Um, existing cross-section, roughly speaking, you have your eight-foot parking. Uh, it's not really marked necessarily, um, but eight-foot parking, two 12-foot travel lanes, and about a 10-foot center turn lane. It varies a bit up and down the corridor. That tends to happen with simply striping like this. There are some sections of small median, as you know. They're relatively small currently, um, and we'll talk about changes to that uh, uh, that we're proposing as well. The cobra head lights are depicted here, I think, correctly. They're kind of big and ugly along the street corridor. We wanted to be sure that those were included for photorealism. Right. <laughs> So we, this is exactly the same dimensions, but one of the things that we've noticed, it doesn't create too much of a problem, but there is this six foot wide concrete pad under, in portions of the, of the area in the parking lane, which may complicate things a little bit when it comes to restriping um, for, for bikeways and, and other, other features potentially on the street. But I want to just point that out. Essentially, it's otherwise the same. So when we look at this cross section, it, it leads, leads us to talk about the challenges and trade-offs, right? When we looked at the maps, and, and Dan briefly showed all the things that came up on the maps, there were a lot of things called for and asked for on, on the quarter. There's a lot of existing constraints as well. And so we have to talk about, we talked a lot about these con constraints and trade-offs throughout the week. Um, and I want to kind of go through some of those to give you a, a sense of so where we are with our, our suggestions and really the alternatives that, how we came to the alternatives that we're going to show tonight. Um, first off, the, the width. Curb, curb to curb width currently is about 74 feet. Okay, it's pretty consistent throughout the, the, the corridor in Albany here. It's actually wider in El Cerrito. We actually measured in Berkeley and El Cerrito to see how that changes. Um, it's wide enough in El Cerrito to actually make it fairly easy to restripe for bike lanes in much of that city, but that's not the case here. And so we'll talk about the concerns and challenges with doing so here. And it's pretty much the same here in Albany, curb to curb, as it is in most of Berkeley, at least in the first part of Berkeley um, across the border at the south end of, of the city here. So when we think, we looked at the, the corridor, we said, okay, the sidewalk width. So what, what's a, an appropriate sidewalk width for this density of, of development? This 13 foot, 12, you know, it varies a little bit. Some areas it's narrower. But the, the sidewalk width there today, if, if we had a situation where we had six foot sidewalks, we'd say, we need to be widening those. If we had a situation where we had 20 or 25 foot sidewalks, we might say, well, we could narrow those and get more width out of the street. But that 13 foot width is, is relatively appropriate. Plus. Moving curbs is an extreme expense. When you start moving curbs, you've got to think about drainage and moving inlets and all of those things that it can significantly add to the cost. That's one of the constraints that we're dealing with is the existing fixed curb to curb width, which could be changed, but, but because of the appropriate sidewalk widths today and the cost, something we probably wouldn't recommend. Caltrans and AC Transit, both um, are pushing, we'd put, be pushing for 11 foot lanes. We've met with, with both in our focus groups and other areas. And Caltrans minimum standard lane width would be 11 feet. They may, there may be some potential for going narrower than that with a design exception. Um, but it's something we couldn't answer today, obviously, because it does require a design exception. AC Transit says well, our buses are so wide and we need, because we have the rapid bus that uses the left lane, we need to have, have um, 11 foot lanes for both of the lanes. And so you're going to see some cross sections that show, I think, 10 and a half or maybe a 10 in one of the lanes. But generally speaking, this is a constraint that we're dealing with. If, if we were working in a city where we didn't have these two constraints, you could take 74 feet and restripe with five 10 foot lanes effectively, a five foot bike, then a seven foot parking lane, and get bike lanes in a straight, fairly straightforward way. But with this, this constraint, it makes it much more difficult to do. The left turn lanes, obviously, they're there throughout the corridor today. They provide where left turns are going to be made, they provide a safety and capacity benefit. If we narrow the road to take out the left turn lanes, for example, and left turns are made from the leftmost through lane, there's a safety issue with that um, related to you know, rear-ending crashes and, and also site visibility for, for um, when two cars are opposing cars are making left turns at the same time. Also from a capacity point of view, as soon as that left lane becomes 
the left turn lane as well, um, then you get no through traffic in that lane. And so again, that could create a problem for congestion as well as safety, and Caltrans might have something to say about that as well. So that's a trade-off that you know, is one of the things that could be taken out to fit bike lanes, but it's a concern. Trees. Um, many of the maps, and many of the focus groups we, we, we heard from the public, trees are something we'd like to see on the corridor. There was a difference of opinion on this in the maps. One of the maps said, no trees in the median, put the trees on the side. Another map said, we want to see lots of trees in the median. So again, trade-offs and, and issues that, to deal with on, on San Pablo. The trees was something we spent a lot of time talking about with the Chamber of Commerce, the business owners as well. Trees inherently occupy the sidewalk area and there can be trade-offs with signage. There's some other treatments such as lowering your signage to orient towards the sidewalk and pedestrians is one solution for signage, but also the idea of putting trees in the median and allowing more tree coverage for, to, to scale the street and those trees are not going to be blocking signage. And it allows us to do some other things along the sidewalk. And speaking of trees, this, this showing the existing crossings, we don't have trees that big in San Pablo today. Um, our graphic designer maybe dropped that one in without, without realizing it shouldn't have gone into this, this uh, creative section. creative license but, there. Yeah, a little, little creative license. But another challenge with trees, we talked to Caltrans about this. Um, for large trees, say trees the size of the ones in Berkeley to be in the median, you need a median about 14 feet wide. They want five feet of offset from the curb to the, to the trees. So maybe, maybe 12 to 13 would work, but they, they, have, they have a concern. Um, it's sad to say, but it's the liability from drunk drivers hitting trees is what their concern is. And, and unfortunately, that is a constraint that because it's a Caltrans road, there's a little more issues with, if you narrow the median, your trees are going to be smaller, essentially. But they can, there can still be trees. Um, parking um, is certainly something that exists along the entire length of San Pablo. Um, there's no off-street public parking in the city, as we've been told. Um, interesting. And one option would be to create some if you're going to take parking off San Pablo. And we'll talk about that when we get some of the options. But, but that's a very important concern. Our, our scope doesn't include any sort of detailed parking study. Maybe that's another step that takes place as we're moving forward to, to the next, um, next level with this as we go into the, the report and the reviews um, from the various city commissions and council. Um, if we're going to add bike lanes, we need roughly additional, additional 10 feet of width. And so where do you get that width? And that's sort of what what all these constraints lead us to, to be thinking about is how do, we, how do we fit that in? And one I didn't put on here, but, but is important to think about is, is driveways. There's a lot of driveways on San Pablo. Anybody want to guess how many driveways there are on San Pablo in the city of Albany in 1.1 miles? 50, I heard? 30? 88. Wow is right. That's about one every 115, 120 feet on average. Of course, some areas it's much more dense and some there's a lot fewer, but and that includes, by the way, you know, that's, there's big places, you know, right out here in front of the, the UC Berkeley property on San Pablo where there's no active driveways currently. So, so it's, a, it's, a, um, it's, it's a pretty big constraint that, again, affects what we can do for medians and bike lanes and everything else. So we'll talk about that in more later. So let's look at San Pablo Avenue. We have really two options here. Um, they're not in order of any preference in this case. They just, we just, did it this way in the sense for convenience of the presentation. But um, option one essentially has wide medians, um, potentially or in places, retains the parking, pr proposed to be protected by bull bouts or curb extensions, and we'll look at that. And it wouldn't, wouldn't have then, with those two things, wide medians and parking, room for bike lanes. And we'll look at another option that does have bike lanes um, in a moment. So here's the existing cross section down in Berkeley. Just to, just to show that this is roughly what could be done in Albany, it's very close to what we're proposing here, 14-foot raised median. Their lanes are striped with 12 and 18 total for this space, which leads you to an 8 and 10 or 7-foot parking and 11-foot um, left right lane, excuse me. Um, that, that's not marked, though. It's just an unmarked space between that parking and travel lane. Um, this would be what, how that could look here in Albany, very similar cross-section. We would propose two 11-foot lanes as opposed to um, the, the inside lane being 12. Um, and then we're showing what we call this super shero treatment, the shared lane marking treatment. And this is still experimental, this green lane treatment. We've, we've talked to Caltrans about this. It would require an experiment to do this. Um, one nice thing about being here in Albany is you've got UC Berkeley right next door. And um, they, Cal has a very strong transportation program and could potentially partner with them on any sort of research that need to be done as part of any experiments like this. So there's going to be a few things we'll talk about that are experimental. Um, but you have that resource, which may potentially reduce the cost of research here in the city, but also to have resources right here, 
without having to bring in a researcher from you know, across the country. Um, other features with this, we don't show the curb extensions in this cross section, though we're going to see some of those in some of the plan views, but potentially could put curb extensions at least at the corners where, where crossings are, and even in between, perhaps, we didn't show that too much, um, it, to provide additional larger trees on the edge of the road. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, we show larger trees here in the center median. Right. If we have 14 feet, we could get big trees out, out in the center median. On the, on the sidewalks, um, you know, one of the concerns now, there's certainly a species concern with the liquid ambers along, along San Pablo, tearing up the sidewalk. That's, a, that's what the tree sort of does. It wants to tear up your sidewalk. The roots grow at the surface, and we have a lot of clay soils. You put those things together, you're going to have some problems. So we would propose that there's special planting treatments that are done here, whether we place some soils under the sidewalk so that the tree roots naturally can grow a lot lower. We would also want to be selecting species that uh, are better suited to, to very urban environments. We're showing a, a, a zone under these trees, which is about 5 feet by 15 feet. That's a really big area. We can get a lot of non-compacted soil in there that can grow some healthy trees and that will reduce the impacts to sidewalks. We're also showing uh, a double uh, globe fixture here. So this is like the fixture on Solano Avenue, very uh, timeless uh, decorative light fixture. But this is a major street. This is San Pablo. Let's do a double. Let's make it a more ornate, maybe a little bit more of a historic fixture. OK, and this next slide is really pretty much the same thing, just showing with that concrete band here. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference in this, in this example. So we also took a look at this. We showed the median in, that, in those cross sections in that plan view. We took a look at sort of where do medians make sense and where don't they make sense. We, we sort of said, OK, we've heard from the fire department that they cross over the median to respond, especially going northbound approaching Solano. We've heard from everyone, really, that the pedestrian crossings um, that are unsignalized, uh, several of them north of Solano, um, are challenging and unsafe. And providing a median refuge, we know from research reduces the chance of pedestrian crashes for crossing the street at those locations by about 40%. So we, we think those are, those are advantages. Obviously, medians have the advantage of having the larger trees, as John was just talking about. So we, we at first said, OK, what, what, what would we do if we set a minimum, um, sort of the minimum recommendation for raised medians? And, and you, it's hard to see the details on this, because we're kind of looking at, at a very broad brush setting. But the idea here was put in raised medians. And you can see the dark spots where the medians would go at those places where there's those, there's those unsignalized pedestrian crossings to help, help for pedestrian refuge. And we'll look at some of those details, by the way, an example of that in a little bit. Um, and then also, any, any areas that currently have sort of double yellow striped areas that aren't really intended for left turns currently, and dropping in some raised medians there, but leaving, for the most part, maybe a, a half to two-thirds of the street without a raised median to allow for left turns to take place into some of those 88 driveways and to allow for, for um, emergency vehicles to better maneuver around congested traffic. Um, on the bottom, though, we, we looked, OK, so more moderate. We didn't say high, because we still left some openings, largely for the emergency response, but also for some, obviously, intersections. Um, any, any intersection, we left left turn lanes into intersections. And also some of the, the larger or more important driveways, some of the significant gaps in this um, are the area between Buchanan here and Solano, for example. There's a lot of driveways, some larger parking lots, the, the large shopping center here. It's hard to see, but that's roughly where it is, where the donut shop is, and, and the paint store at the south end. This um, is also where emergency responders right. tend to use that center turn lane area or even cross over into opposing traffic in order to avoid backups as they're driving to Solano. We thought that was really critical. Yeah, and, that, and that's a point, too, that Solano is the most congested intersection for them going north, obviously. Um, and so they, they use this area more than otherwise. And we also, we're not going to show it because it's not really graphic, but we're talking about some signalization changes here at Solano as well that will go into our report that we think will reduce that congestion potentially on, on uh, Solano and make it more convenient to cross as a pedestrian. Um, and as we, as we go further north, it's another spot where no, no median would be recommended, again, where there's left turns into two streets here, as well as um, high, higher volume driveways. The, uh, that's the, the that's Subaru the block, Subaru. and I think a couple other driveways on the other side are higher volume. We also know um, that uh, rigs park there in that median, right. and we know deliveries often occur in the center median. That was something that the police and fire said, you know, you got to accommodate that. We also heard that from business owners. So the lack of medians in some areas is also strategic and can be aligned to 
where deliveries need to occur. We think that there's also opportunities for some commercial loading that might happen at the, at the curb in a, in a normal configuration, but we understand there's some special conditions. And one of the opportunities that you'll see in a couple of images in a moment is you can texturize the median as well, even if it's still flush. And you'll see that in one of our, our photo manipulations here, photo sims, in just a moment. <clears throat> You know, Anything I wanted else? to give one other, yeah. one other point here. I just did a rough count of tree planting opportunities in these two schemes, and it was about half as much. It was maybe 20 to 25 tree opportunity locations in the minimum scheme, and maybe about 50 in the moderate scheme. So just to help, help give you a metric. Okay, so option two then on San Pablo is, is facilitating bike lanes by doing one of two things, um, or both in some locations. By removing left turns, um, the left turn lanes, and therefore we recommend removing left turns at those locations, since left turns out of the through lane we don't think is viable on San Pablo, um, and or removing parking um, from just one side. And we'll look at the cross sections here to see how that fits, and then talk about some of the challenges with making this work as well. But it's a, it's a feasible cross section, potentially. Um, so this is a cross section where you have a narrow raised median, and you have to raise it in this case, because if you leave this as not raised, your left turns effectively, it's only six feet wide here, um, your left turns effectively take place in part blocking the through lane. So you, whenever you narrow this to, to enough to provide bike lanes while retaining parking on both sides, you've got to have a raised median, essentially, for, from a safety and, and capacity perspective for um, the, the, the through movements along, along San Pablo. Um, the trees here, perhaps these are a little larger than we should be showing. Right. Um, again, the graphic designer um, didn't quite get those where we're talking about with the six foot medium. They're going to need to be smaller per Caltrans. Probably and they're probably going to be pruned off at nice right angles where the <laughs> trucks are going to clip right. off some of those lower branches. Yeah, so it's a challenge with the six foot medium to get any significant trees down the center on this. <clears throat> One other challenge with this is that lane width wise, really talking pretty minimal widths, we're showing in this case 10 and a half foot lane in the center here as opposed to 11, and only five and a half foot bike. We'd rather see at least seven and six. We might adjust this depending on what, what would happen with Caltrans as far as trying to make um, seven, six, maybe 10, or two 10 and a halfs perhaps. But again, that, that is lower than Caltrans's normal minimum of 11 feet. Um, we also talked about making this a four foot median instead to, to get that extra couple feet to make these sort of more standard widths. The challenge there is that we know that the median can serve as a pedestrian refuge, and at, at six feet really is the minimum for that. You know, push and pushing a baby stroller across the street takes up about six feet of length. Someone walking with a bike across the street takes about six feet worth of length, and four feet is really too, minim too minimal for that, and even six feet is pretty challenging. Um, we, I don't think there'd be a lot of places where there'd be a pedestrian refuge um, necessary, so maybe you could narrow it further in some, in some spots, but um, this, could, this is something that's also one of the reasons why we show it at six, at least in this, in this particular section. And again, with the concrete bands on the outside, not much difference there, of course. And then we see, I mean, we, we had some errors again in our, in our graphics. This is the challenge of doing things in a short, compressed charrette format. Um, didn't get any trees or cars or anything on this one. But you can see the other, the alternative cross-section then would be approaching places where you have to make left turns. Um, the turn lane needs to come back, the median would drop, the turn lane would come back, and look, only parking on one side but not the other. And so that we start seeing the challenges for the, the reduction in parking. Um, again, one of the trade-offs with, with trying to get bike lanes on the street. Um, anywhere you need to allow left turns, this is what we recommend is the, is the possible cross-section. The widths do work just fine as far as our normal road widths, 11-foot travel lanes, showing a narrower center turn lane. Caltrans will, will often accept a narrower center turn lane. Um, if not, we could, we could tighten up the, the bike lane widths a little bit, or parking lane width, to get that to 11 or 12 feet. <clears throat> um, and so this is what this looks like when you think about it from in a, just a basic section, you like the last two images. It may, works pretty well, but when you start trying to put those together and think about the transitions, it becomes a little bit more difficult. And I think, did this, I missed, hmm, I, I thought I had something else in here, but I missed it. But um, I, I, I must have covered it up. But there was... I, I noted that this, this transition here, so you're transitioning from the one cross-section with the narrow median and the bike lanes and parking on both sides to the cross-section with the wider turn lane where the median drops away and you have a turn lane here with bike lanes on both sides but only parking on one side. Um, and you have to have these transitions or tapers in between. It takes about, in addition to the length that you need just for the left turn lane, 
to store the cars making a left at those intersections or perhaps even driveways, you need to have about 120 feet of taper length here for a 30 mile per hour speed. And it'd be even further closer to um, 160 or 170 feet for a 35 mile per hour design speed. Even though it's posted 30, Caltrans may want to design for 35. I don't agree with that, but um, in urban settings, we don't like to design for a higher speed than, than the posted speed. But ca state DOTs generally have done that in rural settings and often bring that to urban settings as well. Either way, it's a significant number of spaces. You're talking about um, you know, six or so different additional spaces that, that um, in addition to what, where you have this full median. So you start to see the challenges with making this work. The more often you allow left turns, the, the, the fewer parking spaces you, re, you are, are able to remain with this option. So, but we wanted to kind of really highlight how those challenges work together. And a few details then. So we, these are kind of the basic cross-section alternatives that we're, we're proposing at this point and we'll be going forward with um, in, our, in our next discussions with the city um, and, and um, ultimately be, be writing up in our report. We want to look at some details, though, on some of the other aspects that you asked for, crossings and gateways and some of the other features that, that we think are extremely important to a good streetscape project and a good complete street. So looking, we're going to kind of go from north to south on this, just, just from... No particular reason, but we just put them in this order. Um, starting at the north end, so you have the, the gateway here at El Cerrito Creek, which is also, of course, the border with the city of El Cerrito. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the, the transportation aspects. This is sort of following the, the, um, the medium median. It's kind of hard to say, isn't it? <laughs> so the, 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 not the, the minimal, the moderate, we call the it, moderate the moderate median, median uh, example that I showed earlier, where we're putting medians in most everywhere. Um, would have, you look at something like this perhaps at the north end, where you have left turns into Brighton and left and U turns into the, this one parking lot that serves some businesses here, as well as U turns back into these, these parking lots here. Um, and a similar thing here, U turns back into these, these driveways here. You can see many of the 88 driveways again along San Pablo. Um, notice also, of course, places for trees. Uh, we're showing curb extensions at the corners. Um, another issue that we're working, we're working through with Caltrans on a size of curb extensions, won't go into the details on that, but they're, they're pushing for a really narrow curb extension. I recommend that it be at least six feet because when you really want it to protect the parking in a sense and it's for the pedestrian to be able to see beyond the parked car when they're waiting to cross the street. Uh, showing a, a bus bulb out here in front of Pete's Coffee at the Carlson intersection so we can, we can widen. The bus would actually stop in the lane of traffic. We can have more space for a proper shelter and a proper waiting area. And that's something that can occur in other locations along San Pablo. The sketch is also starting to show uh, gateway treatments, whether we take uh, a special area of the center median and develop special planting, perhaps it's native planting, there could be opportunities for art or signage or sculpture, as well as some special treatments along the sidewalk. In the next slide. And, and also, before we move on from this, I think there's, there's future potential for a greenway trail of sorts in this area. There's been some discussion of that. I don't know how, if that can happen or not, but if it did, having a median here might allow for an improved crossing as well. Good, good. Next slide. So this is that existing location, and uh, the next click does a poor man's <laughs> photo simulation of the idea of adding decorative elements at the creek, bulbing it out so we have a wider public plaza, and there could be special paving, there could be interpretive features, additional opportunities for sculpture. Maybe there's markers, something that says Albany, or you know, probably something subtle that that disting, but something that distinguishes the Albany portions in addition to all the other great treatments that you may do along San Pablo. Something else that says this is Cordonesis Creek. This is Albany. El Cerrito Creek, in this case. Uh, excuse me, El Cerrito <laughs> Creek. Next. We'll get to that one slides. in a minute. <laughs> we'll get there. <clears throat> and this is a, the intersection of, uh, this one's Portland, um, but there's four of these today, four unsignalized intersections, all of which have an, uns an unsignalized pedestrian crossing. looks about like this. Um, you can see just over here is the street. It's a little bit hard to see Portland um, coming into San Pablo. Um, and so we're, we're, we've really thought a lot about how to enhance these. There are some signalization issues, but to put in any sort of traffic signal requires meeting a minimum number of pedestrians in a peak hour. And if you don't meet those, Caltrans is unlikely to put in a signal. On the other hand, Caltrans, based on new, relatively new research, is encouraged to do more than just that. 
Research shows us the worst thing you can do to an unmarked crosswalk, crosswalk exists across here whether it's marked or not, the worst thing you can do is just put in the markings. You want to do more than just put in the markings. And Caltrans should understand that now. The research clearly shows that. And they've supported other cities doing things like what I'm going to show in this image here. We can thank Dan Burden for this particular photo simulation. He did this one on his computer and, and um, shows all, a lot of the features that we've talked about here. And I'll kind of take you through step by step. Note the median here. Um, not required, but an option would be to texturize the flush medians so that they feel, it feels, it's, a lot of we heard some about visual narrowing at some of the, the workshops. And this gives you a visual narrowing of the street regardless of, of um, you know, whether there's cars parked or stopped in this area. There's some friction created by that visual narrowing to some degree. Um, notice that the green super show technique that I mentioned earlier. Um, this, this, um, they're hard to see, but what we propose, as opposed to the in, in, um, in pavement flashers that you've probably seen in El Cerrito, there's a new device called the rectangular rapid flash beacon. It's a little flashing beacon between these, these two signs here, the pedestrian sign and a little arrow that points down at the crosswalk. Been shown to really improve yield rates by drivers on, on streets like this. Um, very bright, even during the day, and drivers tend to yield to pedestrians much more often. The markings here we call an advanced yield line. The idea here is to ask the driver to stop further back from the crossing so that the sight lines are opened up between the driver in the next lane and the pedestrian who starts crossing, that, that, that multiple threat crash type that we know is a very serious type of crash and contributes to crashes on multi-lane roads like this. Sure, one question. We don't have time to take questions much during the, during the discussion, but we'll, we'll take just the one. More procedural questions. So I actually didn't finish that. Yeah. So my Understood. A, as far as the counts go, un understood. That's and that's something that when you when you when you yeah, you, I think your question is about, the, is about the, the if you're trying to for to do this sort of thing, there's no threshold, right? There's no threshold for number of pedestrians crossing. But to put in a red, yellow, green signal, you need about 93 pedestrians in the peak hour, actually more at 30 miles per hour. Um, and to put in what we call the, the Hawk pedestrian hybrid beacon, which we're not going to show in detail tonight, but but is something that we are considering as an alternative to this. Um, you need about 20 pedestrians in the peak hour, which is probably more feasible on some corridors here. And so, again, it's an alternative to, to, to these unsignalized treatments um, that, that was, we, we, I was going to put those slides in, but I didn't. They were shown in the, in the earlier workshops earlier in the week. But, um, yeah, that, that is a good point as far as we, we can do, and it is possible to do counts. Now, Caltrans may not do it in their typical counts, but we've done a lot of studies where we'll count all the pedestrians crossing within a nearby area here. Now, Someone going all the way down the nearest signalized intersection is going, to, is going to be hard to count them. But trying to estimate the latent demand, so to speak, is important, but it's challenging when you're dealing with a, a crosswalk that people are avoiding. I, I understand that issue. Um, and so one other thing with this is that you see here the median is relatively small, just the, just the pedestrian crossing island itself. And so this would fit into that, that minimal median idea that we talked about earlier. And then clicking forward here, um, Dan's dropped in a, a larger meeting with the, with the trees in it um, that, would, that would be the sort of more moderate median solution where you might be able to include more medians down the street. Um, and I should also mention that these, these treatments are going to be easier to build in the, in, the, in the option where you have the wider median continuous, where you're going back and forth from a narrow median to turn lanes. To get some significant portions of this, you're looking at removing parking on more of that one side of the street. right? <clears throat> Um, so moving a little bit further south then, the, in the area between Solano and Buchanan, again, this is showing the, the wide median option here in this, in this diagram. A um, couple of things that I want to point out here. We, we're, one thing we're suggesting potentially are bus bulb outs, where you bulb the, the curb extension out to the edge of the parking lane, 
for the bus stop on far, the far side of the intersection. I know there's been looks at moving this bus stop to the far side before, and there was concerns from some of the business owners. But I, I think that there's potential um, with the bus pullback to do that in a way that doesn't it doesn't require as much, perhaps, removal of parking because you don't have to have room for the bus to get in and then back out again. You just have to have room for the bus to stop in that space. And so there may be some, some potential for that. And both AC Transit and Caltrans generally prefer far side bus stops. The, the provision of bus bulb outs would be something that would have to be approved by Caltrans, the buses stopping in lane effectively. But it's becoming very, very common in, in cities in San Francisco. And, and they're, they're, San Francisco is working with Caltrans to try to do this on some of the Caltrans roads to San Francisco as well. Um, so there's potential for that. It may be something that just doesn't happen because Caltrans says no, but it's something that we show that we think longer term, working with Caltrans, as they, they come around to some of these, these new ideas that work better for cities and for transit, um, is something that we think we want to show, at least for now, that, that and, but we can, when we write it up, we'll talk about the challenge with Caltrans as well and the, their, their issues with it. Um, the, moving to the, to the south here, the potential for mid-block crossing here, but also notice the openings in the median. This is some of the most important places for openings. These could be texturized, like you saw in that other image a moment ago, but allowing for the, the emergency response vehicles to go around this is, if they need to. I understand they do that today. This is the existing island, essentially. Maybe a little bit longer we've made it. Right. Or like they, they, they go around that today now and go contra flow sometimes to avoid the congestion at Solano. And so this allows them that potential. There's also a fair number of high-use driveways here, here. Um, you know, the, the, the Subaru um, service area, um, plus some other, other driveways in this area, but especially this one with the shopping center, banning all the left turns there could be more of a challenge than perhaps some of the or more minor driveways along, along the street. I just want to make a point on bulb outs. I was encouraged, there is a bulb out now in this location just outside on, of the Four Corners side, right. Cafe. It, it exists now, but it's really unremarkable and kind of un, unused in a way. And I think that that's something where in the near term, you know, you guys need to start challenging whether it's the cafe owner or other people to, to claim that space, put in some interesting planting, let that cafe spill outside and, and make use of that public space. And speaking of bulb outs, we, we should be showing bulb outs, say for here, example, in here. Right. Um, you know, we, 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 one of the challenges, again, with the short production time is that we, we don't get everything that we want to see sometimes, and, and, but we do see these potentially being good places for, for bulb outs as well to help pedestrians cross the street and reduce that crossing distance. Moving further south now to Dartmouth and Monroe, um, the, the, uh, this, this connection is one that's been discussed a lot, the potential for senior housing and retail lining here and uh, retail here. We, we understand that the the anchor grocery store that was planned for that corner. Um, Whole Foods has moved to somewhere else, another site, um, but potentially um, they'll be developing this with other retail. The, one of the big challenges we've talked about or issues is you know, how do we connect bicyclists up this area to there and beyond to Buchanan. Um, it's certainly possible to do that in this area, and I'm going to talk about this in a little more detail in a moment, but the challenge with putting a cycle track in this area is you're, you're talking about needing at least 10, maybe 12 feet from, from the UC Berkeley. And whether they're willing to do that is, is a big challenge, I think, number one. And I think there's, there's maybe better opportunities for connecting bicyclists up to the Buchanan uh, bikeway um, on, on paths that don't run along a busy street, I think would be what we would, we, we could be a better solution for that as well. Um, the, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this in a little more detail in a moment. Um, this is currently signalized. We'd recommend opening up all the crosswalks, and we're recommending that in general for the, for the, um, the, the uh, existing signalized intersections on the corridor. Um, and then also, you know, this is an area, if this develops as a senior center, I'm talking about drop-offs and bus, a bus stop. So this area here is a pretty important space that, that makes, you know, the, if you try to put in this sort of site, shared path and a sidewalk behind to serve the retail that's going to be in this area, you really start pushing this back uh, fairly far. I'm going to zoom in here to this area to look at this more closely. First, talking about that issue, that you're looking at pushing this back only about four feet into, into the private property in order to achieve um, a, a two-way path here to connect a, a future greenway along Cordonesis Creek to Dartmouth here, right? 
And the reason is because there's, it's bulled out, there, there's a curb right. extension, so the on-street parking is removed and incorporated into that sidewalk zone made up of sidewalks, of trees, and of the, um, the bicycle path And, and well. trying to do this over here where you really don't, this is a long way, you wouldn't really be able to bulb out like that because of the needs for buses and, and pick up and drop off and those things. Um, perhaps as that moves forward with, with changes in the development, potentially that could change, but I think that's going to be much more challenging to go this way with a cycle track than, uh, or a two-way bike facility than, than here to connect in this area. And I want to talk about, go ahead. And the alternatives of, for, that we're showing for San Pablo talk about bike access on San Pablo. We're trying to say that San Pablo is calmed in terms of vehicles yeah. and that it is made safe for a large segment, maybe it's not all segments of our bicycle population, but it is it is a bicycle uh, a bicycle route. Yep, and and of course we're showing this with the with the option for the wider median and the shared lane here. A similar design could be done for the option that re removes parking off of one side and keeps the wide median, for example, moving parking off of this side perhaps and still bulbing this out. There's there's options that could be done with that. I want to talk about this configuration here. Um, a few ways to make this work. We could do this as what we call a hawk signal, where we signalize this um, and, and provide a, a signal across this. On the other hand, if you, if you drop in this median and these other treatments, this has been a fairly effective way for both bicyclists and pedestrians to cross without a signal. And again, we have those constraints on volumes a little bit. Um, and, and potentially, uh, we don't show it, but the advanced yield line that we showed in that other image would, would be here and here as well. Um, but what this is showing is, is sort of allowing bicyclists both who are riding on the road, and some will choose to do that, of course, to pull in here and have a left turn lane to go that way. Um, bicyclists coming from the path here would cross there next to the pedestrians and go straight through here. Bicyclists coming from Dartmouth would come up the middle and have a bike that takes them across to here and then to the path, or they could turn left onto to San Pablo. And so left turn movements for motor vehicles uh, would be prohibited here. And I think that this is one of the things we think is an important way to, this is, Dartmouth is shown as a future bike boulevard in, in Albany in the active transportation plan. And one of the features of bike boulevards is you, you make it more convenient for bicycling by perhaps changing the stop signs, and Berkeley has a lot of them, of bike boulevards, changing the stop signs to favor this street, right? So you don't have to stop as often as a bicyclist riding down it. Um, and other features to favor it for bicycling if you favor it too much for bicycling, though, cars will want to drive down it more than otherwise. And so you restrict car movements by doing traffic calming features. And you've probably mostly all seen some, some of what Berkeley's done to, to prohibit entries into certain streets. And so one thing that would do that would be not allowing lefts. The, the, this is a well-connected you know, system of streets. There's other ways in to these neighborhoods. And, and I think not allowing car traffic into here is something that we think makes sense. Again, this hasn't been vetted by city staff or commissions, but, but um, this is something we think is, a, is a, to, something to look at as we go forward with this. And Michael, this is the only location that, that vehicle access was, was changed, That's really, right, on, at, on a, at a Pablo. side That's street. Right. Yeah. Okay. Everywhere yeah. else, we're suggesting you still allow the left turn movements that take place at all, all streets. So this was our exception. And there is a U-turn just a little further down, yes, I think, at the next there block. Is. So there would be U-turns here. Back. I'll go back, actually. One of the reasons why we don't show a curb extension here is to allow that U-turn movement to take place and have room for that. And down here in Berkeley, um, there is a U-turn allowable uh, further down. I don't know if it's right here or further down, but we, this is a medium we've added, I believe. I'm not sure. Well, there, there are That's, medium that picks up ties somewhere. in with the ties in with existing theirs, but there are, medium. I forget exactly how far down it is, but there is a U-turn option further down the street. Um, and perhaps that could be changed to put one closer if necessary. Mm -hmm. And then this is the, go ahead, John, this is your, your image. So here we are, we're, we're heading northbound and we're entering into Albany and what exists now is, you know the creek's there because there's a lot of ivy covering it over. It's the, I think you guys are, the, 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 um, the crews are working their way to this spot, I think from the top and the bottom to, to remove the, the invasive ivy. But we want to uncover that. We want to expose the creeks. We want to make the creek part of Albany and part of San Pablo Avenue. So this is the, the, the a potential vision here, adding these decorative elements, a, a, a significant civic monument, either in the median, something associated with the creek, 
uh, provide a curb extension, some native planting, a small plaza area. In this case, there's not an adjacent um, cafe opportunity, but at the previous one, we started to see some of the, the umbrellas and the cafe tables and chairs spilling out into this space, and perhaps something can, can move into this location as well. You can also start to see a lot of bikes in the background coming out of Dartmouth Crossing and connecting along Cordonesis Creek. And the, and the UC Berkeley's development proposes to have retail on the front end of this. There could be potentially that cafe, right? Right. There you, you go. You could didn't be. draw it, but it potentially is possible, right? I think, I think that could work. Um, so moving on to Buchanan Street, and this will go a little faster because it's not quite as complex, and there's already some plans to make changes on Buchanan that are happening starting now, we've heard. Didn't see the construction trucks out yet this week, but we know they're going to come out real soon. Um, so existing on Buchanan, roughly speaking, we have about 79 feet curb to curb. It varies a fair amount depending on which section. This, this particular section is between Polk and um, El, El, El Cerrito Street, I think it's called, right? Not El Cerrito, but just Cerrito Street um, is, is where this particular dimension is taken. But you can see the existing cross section with the narrow sidewalk here, the narrow sidewalk with a little bit of planting in places um, on this side. Um, there's no left turn lane actually at Polk, but, but there's sort of a left turn taper there today. Um, the, the planting yep. in the center median is, is great native planting. Uh, it, was, it was done about 10 years ago, I think. It was a big community effort. It's also grown quite tall, yeah. and it makes it very difficult to see oncoming traffic if you're making a left-hand turn. I see a lot of heads nodding out there, so perhaps there's some rethinking. There's also some very small little trees that are out there that aren't doing a whole lot to calm traffic or to create a gateway into your, into your town. And so this, this we're showing is the, the current project, and those same small trees should be there, not these big ones. This is the project that's proposed to be built um, now with the shared use path on this side, a couple of tree islands in the parking lane, um, several of them along this corridor in front of the park and in front of the school. Um, and, and then no, no trees here yet. I've tried to block them out. But this, this and this side are staying the same. Our graphic artist had to actually redo this. He had a crash in his computer about two hours ago and had to redraw this really quickly and uh, didn't get everything the way we intended. Um, so this would be the sort of a long-term vision potentially after not the currently being constructed project, but potentially the project that come out, out of this process would be that at least in a, in, a, in a curb extension on the left side, you could have um, larger trees. These on the, on the side would still have to remain small. Um, we looked at the idea and some of the table maps said, let's just widen the sidewalk here by moving into these properties. It's not only a challenge from just buying property point of view, but also a very significant grade issue as far as, as, far as um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the so grades. So those houses are. are five feet higher than the sidewalk right. and only about eight to ten feet away. Okay, I wasn't aware of that, but we'll, we, something we can certainly talk about with city staff and see how that can be done. Additional easement beyond where the sidewalk is today? Okay, well, physically, it would still be challenging to build it in much of the corridor, but we can look into that, and we'd love to be able to widen this area out if that's, if that's something that's potentially possible to do that with a sidewalk. Um, trees now could be built in here. Uh, again, the wide enough median would allow for that. I want to go back and point one thing out. One of the challenges with the current project is there's currently, if we go back to the existing, the, uh, this is the existing width. You have concrete here and asphalt for about 10 or 11 feet here. And the, the project that's, that's being going to construction now essentially puts that joint between concrete and asphalt in the bike lane, which is challenging. It's, it's something that I, I'm, I'm quite concerned about as far as it being a, a fall hazard, just riding the street in general. But with that being almost in the middle of the bike lane, it's a concern. We would recommend long term that that, that you saw cut out uh, two feet of that concrete and then repave, when you repave this section of asphalt, the concrete's going to last not forever, but decades, whereas the asphalt lasts 10 to 20 years. Um, and so that would allow for this just to be a better bike lane um, in the long term. There may be other ways to, to deal with that. We've talked to the city staff about repaving in a way that, that, gap, that, that covers that gap. Um, but that's a concern that I think needs to be addressed in the, in the relatively near future. We've talked about adding yeah. some bulb outs along the north side, yeah. less for pedestrian crossings, although we're going to talk that there's a few opportunities for crossings, but more to, to just to calm traffic. We want to tighten up the visual width of that street corridor. We want to provide trees overhead. We want to calm traffic and communicate that you're transitioning from the freeway into a neighborhood. We want to do that here, not just up at Marin. 
but we also want to extend some of the ideas of character, of decorative lighting treatments, of trees and things. We want to bring those elements down from Marin and down to the bay. And a few more details. Um, you want to speak to this one? This is the whole Buchanan corridor. Yeah, I just think, you know, looking, we looked at it as an overall corridor, look, thinking about a sequence of events, looking at gateway treatments down all the way at the freeway bridge. And we'll have a little sketch that starts to talk about some of those ideas there. Um, as you come across the bridge, you have a, the, the, the new crossing here. So the class one path swings around beyond the other side of the redwood trees through the US USDA property and then crosses over near Pierce. There's an opportunity for a plaza there. We'll talk about a little sketch um, that shows that as well. And this is otherwise showing enhancements to street trees, uh, the class one path on the south side and, and some special treatments that we've done some enlargements for yeah. just nearby here at Buchanan and Marin. So this is, this is the intersection of Polk, um, potentially adding a crossing in this area. Could be, again, that pedestrian hybrid beacon or hawk signal. It's not going to meet the warrants for red, yellow, green signal, perhaps for the pedestrian hybrid beacon. Even the city, it's not a Caltrans road, but even the city is, is, is beholden to these standards for minimum volumes before these things are recommended. Um, so the idea of doing a raised median here that, that, that would be large enough, it might, we suggest that it could rest restrict the left turns out at Polk but still allowing left turns in, maybe even creating a small turn lane in there. Because right now, left turns are permitted, but there's just a taper there. It's not really a turn lane. Um, but still providing enough room in here, maybe shortening the one to the USDA driveway a bit um, to get enough room for some trees. Um, we don't show them in this particular sketch, but the same features of the advanced yield line, the raised median refuge, the curb extensions, and the flashing beacons would be a combination of treatments we would recommend for any of these unsignalized, potentially unsignalized, um, crossings across these, these uh, four-lane roads. Another point here, we've heard a lot about traffic cutting through the Albany Hill neighborhood. Yes. And while we can't address all of that as part of our study, we can certainly start to give cues along, um, along Buchanan, cues to you're entering into a neighborhood, and whether we're necking down the entry, there's, those are already pretty tight, but whether we're necking those down a little bit or providing special textures for the crosswalk, something that extends in maybe 15 feet, and so you're, you're driving on a, uh, perhaps a, a decorative concrete surface or some stamped asphalt, something that says you're entering into a neighborhood, there's a threshold there. Yeah. And then this is, the, this is the last detail here on, on this, this, for this image, showing this intersection of Marin. This is technically Marin Extension, um, and this is Buchanan there and there. Um, realigning this, and I've, we, this is a hand sketch that John did, but we've all started drawing this up in AutoCAD to make sure that the truck movements that have to take place here, because they really can't take place down at the, the other intersection here of Marin in San Pablo because of that skewed intersection. A lot of trucks come through here today. We've got to make sure they can still make that. We also have the fire department here. Um, so this, this particular image doesn't really represent exactly what might have to be built, but even in the CAD drawing that we started looking at the truck templates, there's an incredible amount of space here that's, that's um, recovered, right. essentially. And it also reduces the situation where you have these two streets coming in at the same time. I parked my car there today, and, and it's challenging. It's an odd spot where you, you have to look at this, you've got to look at that traffic, and it's a challenging spot for folks today. Making this into two intersections was a much better... Um, safety issue and gives you the space. Even potential for, for extra parking to be placed along here, in addition to it, it, sort of finishing the unfinished sidewalk that runs along this section of the, of the road here. You can't really get from here to here easily without picking your way through that series of islands. We talked a lot about that on the walk on, on Thursday, those of you that were here, or sorry, on Friday, Saturday, those of you that were here for that. Good. It's a great new public space pocket park here uh, opportunity. Yep. And then a couple of gateways you want to talk about, John? Yeah, so you know, here's an idea. This is uh, the, the, really the Caltrans concrete landscape down at the freeway. <laughs> and uh, you know, one click and starts to suggest that we're tying in elements from the Gill Tract, the, uh, the Canary Island Palms. There was a concept. You know, I, we didn't invent anything. You guys said all of these things the other day at the workshop. We just listen and process these things. I get no credit for anything. You guys have done all the work here. The idea of, of carrying some of those iconic landscape elements along Buchanan really makes a lot of sense. I think there's a few key strategic places where you want to do that. I think you could overdo it, 
but this may be a great opportunity for a series of Canary Island palms. Maybe we can redo the signage. Maybe we don't need to do the Caltrans sign. Maybe we can orient towards East Shore, towards Solano, uh, towards San Pablo with some of our own signage. And certainly, whether it says Albany or it says City by the Bay or the village that uh, Village by the Bay, whatever it is, you know, there's treatments to be made to this uh, to this pedestrian crossing. It could be through simple fencing, things that you tack onto the existing fencing. But I think right now there's a lot of room for improvement, and that's what we're trying to say. And one more, I think, right? One more go. slide here. So here we are at the at Pierce. We're calling this the Pierce Street Plaza. This uh, this little road couplet is closed here on the right side of the bridge um, because the new path is going to be coming across and and uh, bike path and pedestrian access to the to the bridge. So the next slide starts to say, you know, how do we start to enhance this? How do how can we claim this as a small pocket plaza? Um, perhaps even the, you know, the, the budding artists and the, the owners of that building and the users there can start to express themselves. Maybe this is a cafe location. I heard that a lot as we were on our tour the other day. Um, and this becomes a small little iconic place in Albany. Of course, John drew this and then this afternoon I said, you know, I, I heard that this is an important fire access, so we may have to adjust the way this, <laughs> this, this looks. It'd it's still a, be possible as long as you leave enough space in the, for the... It's going to be closed, but, but I understand that the fire department wants to have access through there anyway. We've, we've heard that. I, I don't know that that's something that has to stick, but, but that's something that I did hear as part of our work just yesterday, and I forgot to mention it to John. And, he, he and this, this may be an opportunity where, uh, if we can resolve the fire access, this is a place that you all and the owners here start to claim this space. If it's a plaza, how can we start to place some planters? How can we build some wooden boxes? How can we start to grow things and claim this urban space? It's the parklet idea. It's the mini park idea. And even with the fire access, you can do more than just concrete with this. You can, you can put in some, some of these features. They may not be able to be as large as what that seems shows, but there, the, a lot of these features just maybe narrow it up a little bit to maintain that, that fire access. And, they, and the fire can have, they can have things that they can knock down if they have to. Um, that, 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 are, that are sort of breakaway type elements. But there's got, that, that's something we have to, that needs to be well, worked through, I should say. And take a look when you're out there next time. Take a look at all the junk and the, the, the crash barriers that are required. And I think we can do a much more uh, a calming uh, method of solving that problem by, by basically bringing the guardrail treatments all the way out to Pierce Street instead of having to have a freeway crash barrier right out in front of a, a plaza. Oh, oops. Okay. Yep, and that's our back to the beginning. All right, done. <laughs>